It's Shona from Beat 102-103. So excited and privileged to be chatting to actress, singer, and of course, award-winning West End star, Sharon Sexton. Welcome to Shine. Hi, thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. We're so happy to have you. And I should probably point out the fact that we've got a little bit of history because um, we did actually study drama together back in the day. We lived together show as well. That's what only struck me this morning. I was like, oh my gosh, we studied together and we lived together for a couple of years. You know all my secrets. (laughs) Well, I want to find out about yours because we've loads to chat um, about today. Firstly, how are you and where are you during all of this? So I am in Louth in North in Lincolnshire in the UK, which is a few hours north of London. And I've been here since the very first lockdown in March of last year. Wow. Yeah, it's been a long time. So I've lived in London since 2013 and was on tour when the pandemic hit. And um, we had everything in storage because we were due to be on the road for like two and a half years, which never happens when you're a performer that you can see that far ahead with work. So we were like, oh, my God, this is almost too good to be true. And it was. Um, So, yeah, we just found this lovely little market um, town and we have set up camp here. So that's where we're based at the moment. Well, it's a different life, but I suppose for lots of people, it's kind of, yeah, things have changed. It must have been really strange to leave London after all that time. Yeah, it was. And in a way, it's kind of a blessing in disguise. If you try and look for silver linings out of this pandemic, which I think a lot of people have had to do just for their own mental health and stuff to just go, okay, there has to be positives coming from this. And I know at the beginning, there was such a rush of like, oh, you know, the dolphins are back in Venice and there's less pollution in the world and everybody's taking a moment. And then you kind get a bit fatigued with all that so you kind of have to hunt for them those silver linings and every now and again I have to say one was finding this place and being outside of London and just having the space to kind of create and work and not be caught up in a city so yeah I suppose it comes down to the fact that you've been you know you're, you're working for so many years and you're constantly on the go so that's you're stepping back from that but let's go right 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 back to the very beginning because I want to talk about your career today and the fact that well I, I suppose it's a, a question more than I'm sure of this did you always know what you wanted to do because I know that you had the saying and you 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 were always acting but did you was that always a thing for you you know even as as a child yeah it was always a thing that I knew I wanted to perform and I always had that and people say you know bitten by the bug and Mm -hmm. and I was and I did lots of like classes and showcases when I was a kid and it really lit up a passion in me but I never actually believed that I could do it full-time as a career even to the point where I chose to apply for DIT where we trained like the only reason why I was allowed by my parents to pursue that course was because there was a whole year in it dedicated to teaching you how to teach drama and how to work in drama and education and it was that kind of thing which is a bit of an Irish thing as well of yeah yeah, well you know your fallback plan well if it doesn't work out and I never had that kind of full belief and I think that came with age and came with confidence and it took a long time before I went you know what I can actually do this and because there's almost an apologetic thing I think for some people when they when they want to do this as a career that they don't you know you don't want to be seen as believing that it could be a reality so the dream was always to be in the west end but it always seemed very untouchable and it was a lot of work and look and chances and just taking those chances that um eventually got me there but it took a long time but i think that idea that you know it, it's yeah, it's it's not that people don't want to support it, but it's I suppose it's it's harder, isn't it? Did you feel that even I, I'm I'm thinking of my meetings with guidance counselors where I said, I want to be an actress. Yeah. And you know, it's like, well, how are you gonna, you know, how how is that gonna work? What do you really want? <laughs> how are you gonna pay your bills and stuff? And yeah, it's funny. I think it's it's and it's such a funny industry as well. I think even in this pandemic, like people sometimes you can it's so untouchable as a craft or as as, as mm. a thing and it's such a huge part of your identity as well like it's so strange when when somebody sees a plumber is out of work where they can't do their work it's an actual thing or even talking about the hospitality industry where you can see pubs and restaurants and people and it's 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 touchable whereas when you talk about acting or performing it's such a 
transient thing do you know what I mean so it's really hard to for anybody to buy that when you're young and you go this is what I want to do because it's like there's no straight route to it there's no apprenticeship there's no ladder there's no there's no like the, the, everybody has their own journey and their own path of how they eventually get there and it's so not straightforward so for a guidance counselor that's just like yeah I can't help you with that <laughs> and I did get a lot of that I did get a you know but in reality you know you can't do that and that gets in in your head hmm. as well and then you start believing it you know and you start going well I suppose I, I'm probably never going to make it so I'll do this and right up until I was 26 I went back to college and I, I did an MA in directing because I went well I suppose it's not really happening for me and if you have that doubt in your head yeah it, it grows and you know I've heard so much, especially this year, you are what you consume and the thoughts of the people around you really impact how you think about yourself. But I think you touched on there, if it's in you, if it is who you are, it is, if it is part of you, if you're passionate about it, you will absolutely make it happen. And it takes time. It takes, it, it's it's that whole thing of like the overnight success thing. It just, it doesn't work like that. You, you've got to be prepared. No, it doesn't. And I think when people talk about overnight success things and stuff like that, I see so many people who are like, you know, going oh, on the X Factor and stuff, those kind of reality TV shows where people get their 15 seconds of fame where they're going, yeah. you know, this is all I've wanted and I've worked so hard for this. And I'm like, mate, you haven't. And I'm sorry, but you know, you're going to get on there. You're going to get, and that's, that's not real. There's no, depends what you want. If you want fame and if you want to have that 15 seconds of fame on a stage, or if you want to actually have a career doing something that you love, that you're passionate about, that's a really hard, long graft to mm. carve out. And you've got to know the difference between the two of them. Um, it's not it's so much of being in this job is not about the three hours that you spend on stage every night it's what you do with the other 21 hours of the day and how you use them to like yeah. support yourself or have another skill or make contacts or create or it's you know sometimes when I get a job for me like in a long-term job or a long-term contract on a stage I breathe a sigh of relief first of all and go all right okay yeah I've got a job and then straight yeah. away while I'm doing that job I'm going all right, like a swan pedaling underneath the water going, okay, but what am I going to do next? What am I going to, you're constantly going, right, next thing, next plan, using the rest of that time. That's the job, do you know, not the looking great on stage for a few hours. No, that's that's the, the, the part that people see. They don't see what happens behind the scenes. You were very proactive though from, you know, day one. As soon as you finished college, I know that you went out and you were like, if, you know, you said, I'm going to create this, myself you did that initially didn't you because you set up your own theater company I did but that was completely by accident I mean I think there was somebody standing beside me and they got a phone call from a director who had a cancellation in a venue and was like can you put something on and they just went uh when is it in three weeks time no I can't and I just happened to be there at the right moment and went give me that number I'll do it I had no idea what I was doing um but it was an opportunity and I think what I've learned more than anything as well over the last couple of years, when you're creating stuff and you're working, when you have chances like that, they don't come around again. Yeah. You have to absolutely seize them. And sometimes you don't know what you're doing and you learn as you go. And most of the time, the very people at the top, the higher up you go, the more you realize nobody knows what they're doing. They're all just being brave and taking those chances. So yeah, nobody comes and hands it to you. You have to go out and everything you do like that from your creation point of view even if your idea goes belly up or if it doesn't work you get something out of it yeah you'll get a contact or a memory or or a, some connection and it is very much about that isn't it it's about mm -hmm. the people that you meet along the way talk to me a little bit about expectation versus reality in terms of studying drama and coming out of college and you know like what was in your head when you did that kind of final showcase and then the the, the period afterwards oh goodness I I actually again I think I was so um unaware of the industry and of how um pushy you kind of have to be and of how competitive it is and how much how much grit and energy it takes to like be part of it. I think for me, when we finished our showcase, I was very much like I'd worked so hard and there was a goal and there was an aim. And I went, ah, oh, now it's time to relax. And it's actually the very opposite. Like that's yeah. the time when you put your foot on the gas and you have to like 
that takes more energy than any of the energy that you put into your learning it's when you come out that the hard work kind of starts because you just kind of go like I said how do you get in and I ended up like I got my agent by offering to work in her office by, to make coffee for free and I had banged on her door so many times and I put on like a one woman show and I'd invited her and I'd arrest her and I I tried every different trick in the book you know I'd send like a nice purple envelope with a cv or i'd i'd send a, a gift or i'd send tickets or i'd you know and then i'd be like no now today i'm going to try the hard ass approach and i'm going to be like listen you know i believe in me and you need to hire me and i did everything um and it, it is that kind of you know this you just got to keep on knocking um i wasn't expecting it to be that hard i really, really? Wasn't. yeah no i wasn't at all i don't think we were prepared for that i think we were like somebody's going to snap us up if we're lucky and it's a belief thing as well, you know, like where I don't think anybody, well, I, again, I'm not saying this like I know this for you or me, but I think, you know, if nobody came knocking for us in the first six months after college, there was a lot of people that just went, yeah, I'm not, I'm not chasing this. And I can totally understand that, you know, where you just go, this is actually too hard for me because it's so putting yourself out there and making yourself so vulnerable that um, a lot of people change tax completely. It's true. It's true. I always felt lucky that um, in some way I stayed in the same kind of sphere, if you want to call it. Yeah. I know I'm in the media, but I look back and like there are plenty of people from our college course that did very different things, but in, you know, all under the kind of same umbrella. And I'm, I, I, I'm quite proud of that when you look at it, because it's, it's, a, it's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah, big time. And then there's other people who I remember really quickly just went, no, nah, this isn't for me. I didn't think this was going to be this hard. I'm going back. I'm going to be an accountant or I'm going to go back and I'm going to work in a bank or I'm going to go, you know, and just completely went. Yeah, actually, now that I've had a look in. <laughs> yeah, no. And sometimes I'm like, God, they made that decision really quick. And I had bad days where I hadn't been working for a while or gigs weren't coming in or I wasn't getting any castings. And I was going, am I just wasting my time here? Were they really smart? Now that they have a career and a pension and a house. What am I doing? I, yeah. I have to say I admire those as well because that took guts to just say, right, that's not yeah. for me at a, at a very early stage. You obviously in terms of the Irish stage went on to have like a string of successful stints. And then was it 2013 that London came knocking or did you go knocking or how did that work? Was it always in your head? I've got to get over there. Um, it was, do you know what, I, it was actually one of my old teachers, one of my old dance teachers, and they were auditioning, there was auditions for, you know, the, the Irish posse were kind of flying over and back to London, and there was a couple of people that had gotten gigs and in the West End, and I never actually just thought that it would, I, I never thought that I was good enough, to be honest with you, I was like, I just don't know, if, and that's a thing I think everybody has in their head, you know, constantly, you have that imposter syndrome of going, I, I, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be here. Do, am I good enough to, to even be in this room to be with these people? And yeah, you've got to knock that stuff on the head, especially in this game, like really quickly, because you will meet so many people that will go, yeah, you're not good enough. Get out. And they're wrong, but you know, you let it in. Can I ask um, you just how do you do that? Or how have you done that? Because that's massive for most people. And I think it's the honesty around that that we need to talk about and own it. Because I think yeah. it's there for all of us, no matter what stage of career, no matter how successful we've been, it can still get in. Yeah, I think talking about it is really good because I think when you connect and you see other people have it that and have these same feelings and these same self-doubts that you go, oh, OK, first of all, thank goodness it's not just me. And now I don't feel like a crazy person. And um, so, yeah, I think that is a really good thing. And I think um, anybody who hasn't had that moment of doubt in their life is um, lying or delusional um, <laughs> because I believe that everybody has it. And it was it was actually it was that. Um, what I was it, with your last question just what we were talking about was that dance teacher that just said to me Sharon the job has to go to somebody why not you and when she said it to me that blankly and that plainly she was like it's a gig it's a job it's a paycheck you can do it why why can't it be you yeah. and I was like well why can't it be me actually you know so um I think sometimes when you say something out loud as well like, that you've admitted that you wanted it makes it even scarier to to go after it you know but I remember that being a real ping moment with me when she said that and I was like you know what I'm going to try um and yeah when especially when you come over from Ireland to the West End like you're my very first audition I was 
in a changing room with these people who were running back to their matinee and who were like talking about all the people that they knew and I felt like such an outsider and I was like I'll never belong here and isn't it so it's just so bizarre how you know well not bizarre but I think it's just such a a testament to like anything is possible if you can believe in yourself and I still have imposter syndrome in, in and I still have those negative thoughts about myself particularly when you're like in a rehearsal room or you're you're performing something for the first time um, in front of like a creative panel and um, you have that that feeling and, the, uh, and that, that doubt and I have I've lost gigs I've had I've come right down to the wire for gigs I've been cast in shows and then they, they've gone it's not right and it's gone somewhere else or I've filmed stuff that hasn't made the cut where they've gone no so I'm kind of going if that's the worst that can happen then it's happened yeah. and anything that happens in reality can't be worse than what I put <laughs> myself through up here so one thing I did read by from somebody which is really good was like every time you have a negative thought about yourself it's about training yourself to catch yourself in that moment and to stop yourself and go right why am I having this mm. is it constructive is it going to help me in any way and usually the answer to those questions is no so it's like right immediately you've got to retrain your brain and go okay say something nice to yourself yeah treat yourself like you would treat your best friend um and force yourself to just take a breath and take a pause and go I'm really good at this or I'm having a really good hair day or I was a really good person actually when I gave my friend that time last week or just something positive yeah. that you kind of have to and you have to train your brain to start thinking that way about yourself because otherwise I mean you have to be careful about how you speak about yourself as well yeah like, I see that with so many students where they go I can't I, or I'm not good at this or I'm like no you've got to change the language that you use around yourself I want to improve this or I could be better at this not I'm no good you know it's such a it's such a thing you I think being aware of it is the the main thing and then you can start to uh, attack it it's huge it's everything and it's it's a it's a daily kind of practice I suppose and we've got a we've got to work on it it doesn't come easily but I think the other thing that you mentioned there particularly when you said your dance teacher is it's about the people that you surround yourself with it's about about the people that lift you up that make you feel good about yourself because in order for you to, to do well in anything in life you've got to have those people on your side yeah 100 and it's about I think like taking what you need and throwing mm. the rest of it away whether that's from critics or teachers or um friends mm. even who sometimes mean well you have to be your own judge on what you need to hear and about what you let in and what you don't because especially in this game there everybody has an opinion and unfortunately when you put yourself on a stage or on a screen everybody's opinion is valid and they're entitled to it and they share it and it can be really hard particularly like even down to blogs or reviews or comments on twitter once you put yourself out there you have to be prepared to manage how you consume that information and i suppose that's in every every walk of life even with like i'm so glad shona we did not have the the facebook or the instagram or the social media pressures that yeah. people have these days because every everything you, you put out there you're leaving yourself so open to this baseless discussions and like comments and opinions mm. and stuff so I think for me I'm like I always that was my always my mantra with reviews that um I don't believe the negative stuff and I don't believe the positive stuff so I never get elated if I get a good review I just have to go yeah it's one person's opinion it means nothing Okay. And vice versa, if it's a negative review and if they don't like it, it's one person's opinion. It means nothing. I have to be in, I just have to know that I'm giving my best and I'm doing my best and that I'm prepared and that I'm, I'm open and that I'm working and that I'm, I'm showing up. And after that, it's kind of like they can keep their opinions. It doesn't, doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> but it's That's really hard to be that, to be that strong in yourself. You've days where obviously, you know, it can just take one little comment yeah. especially in London when you come off a show and you've run out the stage door and you're on the tube and people are discussing the show around you they don't recognize you that's happened to me so many times and I've heard thankfully not so much about myself but about colleagues and stuff and I'm like 
I am so glad that they are not on this tube home because that would crush her. Do you know what I mean? Where you don't even realize it. Yeah. That's like a, a real life review. No, nobody wants that. No holds barred. Yeah. Your first role in the West End was, of course, in the commitments. So from day one, did you have that mantra of I'm not going to believe the good, the bad or like, how you know, because when you're starting out, it must be hard not to get swept up by it all and get excited by where you are and what you're doing and living this dream, I suppose. Yeah, totally. Um, um, with the commitments as well, I think it was such a, a frenzy because there was a whole Irish posse. We were like a family that had kind of came, came, a large percentage of that cast were Irish and it was our first gig in the West End for so many of us. I mean, looking back, the producers were mental. I don't know what they were thinking. But um, with that job came as well. It was a really good friend of mine. I was actually Steph McKeown and I was the fairy godmother and she was uh, Cinderella and we were in the Gaiety together. And we were only, we'd finished in the Panto a couple of weeks and she just messaged me and said, um, I'm just checking, are you going to London for this audition? Because I'm, I'm wondering if you are, what flight are you getting? Because I'm going on this one and maybe we could go together. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And we had the same agent. <gasps> yeah. So I straight away rang my agent. And to be fair to her, she wasn't there. It was her assistant who was actually in the office. My agent was on holidays. And I was like, eh, you're booking people in for Grindrod in London? for an Irish show for the commitments and I'm not being seen. And she's like, oh, just let me sort that out for you now, hang on. So I always say that to Steph, I owe her, I owe her that gig, I owe her th that break into London. She she got me on that plane. Um, but even down to that, like, do you know what I mean? If you had a hesitated there and gone, maybe they have submitted me and maybe I'll just wait. It's like, no, no, if you've got to, you've got to be knocking constantly. Um, so yeah, when I went over first anyway, I was just like, London, oh my God, people are paying me to do this, it's amazing. And I learned so much on that show, all the stuff that you can't learn in college, like that you learn by doing the job. So I'd say to anybody who wants to do this, it doesn't matter what way you get your foot in the door, get in, be a sound a technician assistant assistant somewhere start there because the things you learn just about how a whole company works, I was a bit in awe of everything. Um, and then again, you learn so much from watching people around you. And I think the politics in a building of a show like that, it can get so kind of like in a college, um, mm. I suppose, that are in your classmates where you become a unit and you become a family and it can get really um, toxic because you're, you're in that building like six days a week and it takes over your entire life. It's, it's, it's not just a job. Like I said, it, it becomes a, a lifestyle, it really does. And they, we were the only people that we all knew because we all moved to London at the same time. So it was really um, tight. And it was kind of watching older people in the cast, like Judy Worsley, who's a really good friend of mine now, who had been working for a long time. And when I seen how much she treated it like a job and she had her family and she had two kids and it was a clock in, clock out, I get to do this, but she never got dragged into anything or into any politics or into any dramas and stuff. And I learned so much from watching how other people just the, didn't sweat the small stuff. People who'd been in the game a long time, you know? And Sean Kearns, who's a lovely um, Irish actor actually from Northern Ireland, he played the dad in it as well. And it was the same with him. There was just, they had such a grounding in themselves. And I was like, that's what I want to, that's how I want to conduct myself. That's how I want to be in this business that I can actually be grounded in some kind of reality and learn not to um, not to get swept up in it all. Cause it's so easy. Do you understand what I, I don't know if that makes sense? Oh, like totally. I can, I can imagine it. And the fact that you were able to decipher that from that first role there was mm -hmm. incredible. I'm sure it took work to kind of, you know, get to that point because I suppose yeah. you switch from one role to the next and you're you know, there's a whole set of new people in your life and you're you're spending all the time together it's it's a it's a strange one yeah it was bizarre and it was just little things like seeing how they the biggest lesson that I learned in, in that as well not that I was ever rude to stage crew or technicians or stuff like that but I just they did their job and I did mine yeah. Whereas when you look at the people who've been in the business a long time, a lot of the reason why they work again is because they show up and they do their job and they're consistent and all of that kind of thing. They're talented. But such a huge part of it is that they're a team player. 
and that they know the name of every single crew member and every single sound technician and every single lighting operator. And not only do they know their names, they know what they do. They know how important their job is. They really respect their jobs. And there is this kind of, whereas when you see then some little twirly going, oh my God, uh, why is this bun falling out? Where's wigs? And why is my spot not on me? And can costume please take this in? And you just go, oh, that's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. And they're the people that, they they are splash in the pan or is, is that the right flash in the pan splash flash, in the pan? flash yeah right. I think it's they, flash. Are. <laughs> they are and and it's the people who are like so I then make it my business now I make it a point of like no matter where I am no matter what I'm doing I get as many names as possible and have a chat with every single person about what they're doing that it's so not about me being on the stage it's about us all creating this moment and I'm actually like I'm the cherry on the cake but every, all the magic is what happens around me, you know, to be able to put me there. It's a team. It's a team. I, like, so you, you did the commitments, you did Billy Elliot, you did Copacabana, and then you went on to play a role which had never been played before. So you were responsible for the very first Sloan in Bad Out of Hell. And I don't know, is that, you probably make history by doing that do you when you're the first yeah the original yeah. cast which is really cool and like yeah. again, that was like a, something I never thought would happen for me I had, uh, and all those of the shows that you mentioned I had very small roles in them but I was cover so I was swing or I would cover and I would um and then somebody said to me which is very wise for anybody that does want to go into the business they were like if you're a swing never put it on your cv because once they find out that you can swing that is all you're going to do and it's so true there are people who are in and that's what they want to do and if it's what you want to do great but you have to have such a brain that you can play five different people in one night if you need to if there's oh. two people sick or you can do a bit of this track or a bit of that track or cover this so you're you're like the 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 savior that props the whole show up um yeah so I but I did that and I learned so much from doing it but I wanted a role and I wanted to and when I got to cover when I got to understudy and I got to play the parts it was like so amazing you get guaranteed holiday dates and performance dates obviously because the show has run so long so I would live for that week where I knew like Jess was going off on holidays and I was going to be on for yeah. the week you know um and then when the casting for Bad Out of Hell came in, I was um, completely, I read the role and I was like, this is so me. This is so me. If I don't get this, like, or at least get a, re a recall or at least get a cover. Um, yeah, it felt really right. And it was like one of those magic moments where people go, you know, the, the, the role that you're waiting for. Um, and yeah, but and because I believed in that and I felt like, like I'd done my time when I walked into the room for that casting, I was like, I'm ready to show you that I can do this. Mind you, I did trip over. I did face plant and I went into the room. <laughs> Which is funny because she's a quirky character and there was a lot of slapstick comedy in it. But honestly, the casting director said to me, all right, Sharon, you're in. Just be careful now because there's a lead going across the floor when you go in. And I was like, all right, okay. <laughs> I was right over. It was like he hadn't even spoken to me. And he was like, did you not just hear what I said to you? And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'll just do that again. Um, yeah. Oh, hilarious embarrassing but anyway besides that um after I came out I was like I've got to get that has to be that's one of the best auditions I ever did in my life and then my agent rang me and I was like please tell me that you are ringing me because I've got a recall and he's like babe they've already recorded you they're sending your tapes to Jim they want you that's it it's yours and I was like what and like to be second cover mum and Billy Elliot I had done seven rounds and four dance calls so I was like really so yeah it it was very special and very magic to um get that and it yeah it changed a lot for me because it meant being seen finally in a in a different light of of actually playing a character so yeah, yeah. And, then, and all and all those years of hard work if i suppose it just comes together and it feels like yes it's paid off i'm being recognized for what i've put in and yeah the, there's those moments that i suppose as an artist you just live for don't you yeah totally yeah, i was just about to go onto the tube because i'd only left about 15 minutes earlier the audition and i was about to go underground and i remember i went down and i literally bawled my eyes out on the tube by myself like pure happiness or just i don't even know if it was happiness it was just that feeling of relief of just yeah. going and again why do i need that validation from anywhere else but we do and it's that thing in your head of going i'm good enough 
Yeah. I knew it. I knew it. I didn't <laughs> know it, but now I know it. You know, yeah, it's amazing. Totally. I am really admire your honesty so for anybody I suppose that's watching today and thinking this is something that possibly I want to do it's in me it feels right not sure how it's going to happen what's your advice though just from that kind of place of you know believing um I suppose you hear all of the hard knock stories and you hear all of the, it's really tough and it's really tough. Um, and that can kind of sound romantic in a way. I think mm. some people who really go, oh, but I have that drive and I have that stamina. And the only way you'll know is if you go for it. But what I would say to you is it is not just a job. It is a lifestyle choice. And it is, if you become successful at it and if you can carve a career out of it, it is missing birthdays and family events and having one of the most unsocial jobs ever because you are you are the entertainment when everybody else is off. So you are working when everybody else is chilled out. So it means missing a lot of, um, sacrificing a lot of um, personal things and that's really something to keep your eyes open when you do go into this business, because that is a, the, the truth. And nobody kind of prepared me for that so much. But I will say to you, though, is though the people and the friends and family around you who support you, what was it? Somebody said to me once, those who mind, they don't matter. And those who matter don't mind. And my really good friends and family know this is what I want to do. And they're completely understanding of it now. I did have ruffles with a few things where people were like you know but you they, they just didn't get it they just don't understand the commitment that it takes or whereas now if I go I can't meet you because I'm not able to speak today because I have two shows tomorrow they just they understand they get it and but it is that kind of thing from a health and a physical point of view and a mental point of view so there's a lot of sacrifices but there's a huge payoff but don't dabble unless you're prepared to take them on board um, and the other thing I would say is just like I said at the beginning, take chances, be brave. What have you got to lose? Like, I wish somebody had said that to me. And then in another way I don't because I got here through a journey that I got here when I was ready to accept those things. But just, you've got to push yourself and you've got to ask for it because nobody, nobody will come knocking on your bedroom door going, oh, I hear you singing into that hair, but you're really good. Would you like a role in the West End? If only. <laughs> Brilliant. On that note, thank you so much for being uniquely you. Can't wait to see you on a West End stage um, in the very, very near future, hopefully. Sending you loads of love to Louds in the UK. Thank, thank you so much, Sharon. Sex and continue to shine. <laughs>